and I hope maybe you have a great call. Thank you, Felicia. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's class, which is the Windsor Newton Bicycle Wall Art. My name is Tim DePack, and I'm from Windsor Newton, and I'll be your moderator for today's class. I'm also being joined by Mandy Peltier, who will be your artist instructor for today's class. And Mandy will be taking you through today's class by providing information about the products being used and showing you how to perform some of her favorite watercolor painting techniques, all while creating this colorful bicycle with a basket of flowers using the Windsor Newton Cotman watercolor sketcher box set. She'll also give you a sneak preview of her next class, which is called Birds of Paradise, which will be performed on June 7th at 1 p.m. Central Time. There was a sketch available for this class. Uh, we will drop that link in the chat box for you on the side. And also upon completion of this class, you'll be sent a survey in your email. Please let us know what you thought about the class, how we did, and if there's any particular topics that you'd like to see Mandy perform in the future. The class will be available 24 hours on michael.com and a YouTube channel. And also please feel free to follow along and paint with Mandy or sit back and relax and enjoy the class. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Mandy. Thank you, Tim. Hi, everyone. Like he said, I'm Mandy Peltier, and I'm excited to be back today. I was actually reading some of the chat comments as Felicia and Tim were giving the rundown, and you guys are so sweet, and I like seeing where you're all from, too. I didn't see any Georgia today or Indiana, so I'm originally from Indiana, but I live in Georgia now. So um, if you are from there, I just missed it. So anyways, I'll go ahead and share my other camera so we can get going today. All right, so the good news about this project, the hardest thing I think is sketching the outline since the bicycle is sort of symmetrical and has a lot of little curved lines and details. So um, if you didn't already transfer the outline, I think that's the hardest thing about this entire project. So we'll comfortably be able to fit this into the one hour class today, which is exciting. Sometimes we have to speed along. So I'll try to slow down a little bit today and, and not go at my normal pace, but I can't promise anything. <laughs> All right, so um, let me go over the supplies real quick so you can just make sure you have everything you need to be successful. I have a glass of water. I'm using the Skechers Pocket Set again. I have a smaller artist palette. We'll be mixing seven colors. I'm using, once again, the professional watercolor paper from Windsor & Newton. That's 140 pound cold press. I have paper towels for blotting. You can also use um, a napkin or, uh, you know, like kitchen cloths. And I have an eraser and graphite pencil for the outline and I'll be using a number four round brush. So just the number four round brush. I just have two, because if you've taken some of my previous classes, um, I've started using some older number four brushes that I don't paint with anymore to mix my colors so that my nicer newer brushes can more easily maintain that sharp point, which helps you uh, maintain control better as you are painting. So we're going to start by sketching the outline, which is usually how we start my classes. So I'm going to just move the finished example aside for a couple minutes here while we sketch the outline. And I'll pull over a copy of the outline so you guys can see what I'm doing. So this was provided when you signed up for the class. It was sent to you via email, I believe. And I was kind of thinking, how do we start this bike? How can we get it so that it's centered on the paper? Because uh, there's not a real obvious central point on the bicycle. So I decided it makes most sense to start with the lettering. And then we can sort of line up elements on the bike with certain letters. OK, so that's where we're going to start is enjoy the ride lettering. And the is right in the middle. So I'm actually gonna start with the um, because it is the middle point of the paper. So I am going to start with the T just sort of bottom middle of the paper and write the, and then I'll just sort of work my way over. I'm just sort of following my lettering here. And then I'll move on to ride. And you could do a different phrase adventure or enjoy the journey or you know anything else that sort of has a bike kind of feel. I saw someone said they're hoping to turn this into a greeting card for their granddaughter. I think that is a really good idea. And then I'm going to go backwards and do enjoy. If you watched my Valentine class from February, I talk about how you can score watercolor paper to make a nice fold for a greeting card. So if you don't already know how to do that, you can watch the end of that class or watch the whole thing if you haven't taken that class. And uh, you can see how to score your watercolor paper with a butter knife and a ruler to make a greeting card out of this. All right, so I have my lettering, enjoy the ride. So the two bicycle tires. 
the left wheel sort of lines up right in the middle above the end of enjoy. So that's sort of how I'm going to use as a guide. And it's about an inch above. So I'm gonna start at the end for enjoy. I'm gonna move my pencil approximately an inch above and just draw a little dot. Just a little dot about an inch above the end. And then I'm just going to eyeball three inches above that and draw another dot. So this is how I'm gonna draw my circle. You can also use, if you have a water glass, you can just trace around the water glass or um, another cup. I have my glass of water here that hopefully I'll drink out of instead of my watercolor glass. <laughs> I've done the latter before. Um, and then I'm going to make two other dots to make almost like a cross or a T. So um, I'm just kind of making a dot to dot for my circles. So you can leave it with the four or you can even add some diagonal ones. So you're really doing a dot to dot. This is just how I'm doing it. You can freehand it too. And then I'm gonna connect the dots to make my circle. And I'm gonna twist as I go. So I'm always sort of working from the same angle here. And we have the outer ring for our tire. Now I'm going to draw that second smaller circle that makes up the inside part of the tire. There's only about an eighth of an inch separation between the first circle we drew and then the second slightly smaller circle. So I'm just gonna eyeball it. I'm just going to leave about an eighth of an inch spacing between my two circles. And I don't really need the dots for the second one because I can just sort of use the first circle I drew as sort of a guide for me. And we actually may not completely fill in these circles with paint. We may not, so. And then we're gonna repeat the same process to the right circle. The right circle is just above the letter D in the word ride. So same thing above the D, I'm going to go about an inch up and draw a dot. I can use the other uh, tire now as a guide and I'm going to draw another dot. And I'm gonna make that T shape or cross shape by drawing two more dots on the side. And if you want, you can do some diagonal dots and then we'll play connect the dots. Or like I said, you can trace around a cup. I also have a circle stencil that has circles of different diameters. That is really useful to have if you're an artist. Really, really useful. I have a few of those. I have one that does ellipses too. It's really helpful. And then I'll draw the inside circle. Okay, so we have our two circles. So this kind of helps us with everything else, kind of figuring out everything else. So um, I'm now going to draw, I guess you call them maybe tire guards. They're part of the bike frame. There's one on each bicycle tire. The, the far right tire is sort of upper left and the left tire, it's just right above the tire. So I'm going to draw those on. So it almost looks like it's a tumor on top of the tire at this point, but it's not. Once we get the rest of the bike drawn, it will make a lot more sense. And then I'll draw the one over here. And then we'll draw the rest of the frame. And we'll probably have a little bit of erasing to do because some elements of the frame are front and some are kind of tucked in the back. So we may have to do a little bit of erasing today, but we can do that. I might be wrong, but I think we would call those a fender, I think, fender. Just like, a, like a car. Okay. I think. So Tim, you're going to have to help me with bike anatomy today. I got <laughs> another picture up just in case we need to get detailed instructions about which, which piece we're drawing. <laughs> Cause I'll be like this thing here. I'll probably be saying things the wrong way. Okay. Like this thing here, I couldn't. So I think that might be the chain guard cover. I don't know for sure, but we're <laughs> going to draw this thing here. So it kind of starts right in the center of the left tire. And I'm going to start by just drawing an oval, like a really long kind of narrow oval. It's only about a quarter of an inch wide or so. And it doesn't go quite all the way to the right tire. So leave a little bit of a gap. And then on the right side, I'm going to draw sort of a, a crescent shape and a race. So we kind of create the opening for uh, the chain. And then I'll go ahead and draw a circle to connect that. So we're gonna make this here. 
So it's sort of a circle that sits beneath the oval we just drew. And then inside that circle, I'm gonna draw a smaller circle and then I'm going to draw lines around that circle that serve as the chain guard, I believe. Tim, you can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> and then there's- I'm gonna go with you on that as a chain okay. guard. I don't know what it is, but I'm gonna say that's a chain guard. <laughs> We're just going to make a fool of ourselves today is what we're going to do. All right, so I'm going to draw um, the bar for the foot pedal. It starts right in the middle of that smaller circle we just drew and connects underneath that what fender, I think is what you said it was called. And then I'll draw a small rectangle for the actual foot pedal. And then I'm gonna go ahead and uh, draw the chain as well. So there's a chain that kind of starts under the chain guard and then goes up to the fender. We're getting there. Like I said, this is the hardest part of the whole process, I think. <laughs> All right, so now what I wanna do, I think, I mean, we could go a number of different ways with this, but I, I think I'm going to draw this sort of angled line here that goes from the fender up to the seat um, so it's, there's just very, maybe a 16th of an inch spacing from that uh, tire guard or whatever you said it was, Tim. So I'm gonna draw that up, two parallel lines, maybe an eighth of an inch spacing, two parallel lines that are at an angle. And then we can draw the bi bicycle seat. And I'm just gonna sort of copy the shape of the bicycle seat. You can just draw a kind of a rectangle too, if that's easier for you for the bicycle seat. And then I'll draw this sort of curved line. There are two parallel lines again that go from the bar that connects to the seat down to um, the chain guard cover. So I'm gonna go one angle and then another angle down and then a second parallel line. And this is one, this is a front facing part of the frame. So I'm going to erase what I can see of the tire and the shin guard. There we go. And then I'm going to go ahead and draw this sort of shelf that's on the left tire. You know, when I lived, I've told you guys before, I, I lived in Poland for three years and people ride their bikes everywhere there, more so than here in the US. And um, I, so I took part, I rode my bike to the farmer's market a lot and I used my little back shelf, I used the basket. So <laughs> this brings back memories, this project here. All right, so there's our little back shelf and then I'm gonna draw the second part of the frame that connects from the shelf down to um, that other one we drew just a second ago. And then this is another one we'll have to erase some lines because it is in front of the tire and the fender. All right. And then I think what we'll do before we do these two parts of the frame, I'll go ahead and get the handle and then this part of the frame. So I think I'll start on the middle of this tire and I'm just gonna basically draw a rectangle that goes at an angle and then slightly steeper angle up, longer lines about two and a half times as long. And then sort of a backward C shape, all parallel lines. Okay, so then, I got the technical. So you got the handlebars and then the front piece going down to the, that's the fork. <laughs> Look at him. He's a bicycle expert. It's a good thing he's here today. I'm Google cheating. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm the type of person where like, you know, I'm like this thingy is red and it's this long. I'm that way with directions too. I'm like, tell me to turn left at this store, not the street name, just tell me like what's there and I'll turn, the, I'm very visual. <laughs> All right, but that makes sense if I'm an artist, right? Okay, so now we'll go ahead and draw these two bars. And I got that one for you too, top tube and down tube. Top, that's what it's called? Top tube and down tube, yeah. I would have never guessed that, okay. <laughs> Together, it's all the frame. So if you're doing a whole piece, it's the frame of the bike. All right. So I have those two. And then I then we have the, the basket. I know that one, Tim. I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So from the handlebar, I'm going to draw just a small line, sort of the holder for the basket. And then the basket, I'm basically going to make 
at least along um, the bottom part, a curved square, and then I'll make uh, straight angles or right angles at the top. So I'm gonna do curved along the bottom, up and then straight across for our basket. And then what's left are the spokes. I know that one too. Okay, so for the spokes, I'm just gonna draw lots of straight lines going in all different directions. And I'm gonna use my outline as a guide um, and try to pretty much get what I have on my outline, but it may end up looking a little bit different and that's okay. Um, you're doing some that are parallel, some that look like V's, some that just kind of crisscross all over the place. And you can put in as many or as few as you want of these spokes. And some can be closer together, some can be further apart. Um, it's really up to you. These are just going to be painted in black. One nice thing about this piece is it really is quick um, to paint because a lot of areas on the bike are only going to receive one application of paint. Um, so it makes it a little bit quicker. We're not going to be doing first layer, second layer, third layer. I mean, that's not true for all of the bicycle, but for much of the bicycle, that is true. So it kind of speeds up the process just a little bit. And it's not very big. So this is a good quick project. If you really like this design, you could whip a lot of these out and pass them out as gifts. Be a good summary gift, I think, for a friend. Okay, and then I have spokes on the other tire. It didn't matter which tire you started on. If you started on the left tire, that is fine. One of the things, if anybody doesn't want to make it a red bike, you can change the colors any color they want. Blue bike, green bike, yellow bike. Yes. I'm a sucker for teal. You want to make yours teal, you'll mix ultramarine blue, viridian hue, and white. If you want to make it teal. We're building our chicken coop right now. And guess what color it is? Teal. Because <laughs> it's my it's one of my favorite colors. And we have baby chicks in our house right now. I just have to say it because it makes me so happy. They're so cute. And we've named them all. They all have ridiculous names. All right, so there's our outline. Enjoy the ride. So we're gonna start by mixing just one paint color black because black is going to be used for the lettering. And so I thought we could paint on the lettering. And while that sort of sets into the paper, we can mix all of our other colors because otherwise how we're gonna be painting and where your wrist might be, you could smear the paint. So let's go ahead and get the uh, lettering out of the way. If you don't wanna paint it on and you happen to have a black marker, you can use that too. Uh, Windsor & Newton sells a pro marker that you could write the lettering on with, or they sell this Windsor & Newton fine liner. This is the 1.0 size, which would be good for the lettering. So you can use a marker too, if you don't wanna use paint, but I'm gonna go ahead and set this aside for just a second so we can mix our paint. So I've mixed black in a lot of my classes, um, and today we're going to mix it the same way I normally do in all my classes by using ultramarine blue and burnt umber. I'm going to start by taking my older number four brush and just swishing it in the water to get the bristles evenly wet. And then I'm going to use my brush as if it were a spoon, and I'm going to place three scoops of water into one well on my palette. So I'm going to just scoop it out, kind of hang it over one palette, or one well on my palette and sort of shake my brush over top of it. And that's one scoop. So I'm gonna do that two more times. And that just gives us a nice base of water to work with to mix our black paint color. And we'll be using three scoops for every color today. It's usually my go-to number of uh, scoops of water is three. So um, when I mix black, I find it usually takes more ultramarine blue than burnt umber. So I'm gonna start with burnt umber and I'm gonna start by placing three passes of burnt umber into those three scoops of water. If you're new to my classes, when I say pass, I'm going to take my brush, I'm gonna run it over or stir it into that half pan for just a second or two, not long. And then I'm going to stir it into those three scoops of water. I'm gonna wipe it on the rim of that well, and that's one pass. Now I normally do it pretty quick. So my next two, you'll, you can see I, I do it pretty quick here. And that's three passes of burnt umber. And then what I'm going to do is I'm essentially just going to add passes of ultramarine blue to this brown until I have black. Um, it'll probably take four or five passes of ultramarine blue. Uh, if yours ends up looking very midnight blue colored, 
then you can add more burnt umber and it can be a bit of a back and forth game to achieve that blue. Um, but I usually find it takes a few more passes of uh, ultramarine blue than umber to get black. So I need to see with each pass of blue, it gets a little bit darker and a little bit darker and a little bit darker until you kind of achieve black. And you may like a black that's a little more on the blue side, or you may like a black that's a little more on the brown side. So you can kind of play around until you get a black that you like. Now, this is going to be a softer black than, say, if we had a, a true black half pan in our set. But I kind of like a more natural looking black. I think it, it looks nice. All right. And the science or color theory essentially behind this is brown consists of all three primary colors. And then blue, like I said, usually when I mix my own blacks, I, I find I need more blue. So we're basically just adding enough blue to the three primary colors to get black. So basically just a ratio of mixing all three primary colors together. All right. So we are ready now to uh, write on the lettering. So I'm going to set aside my older number four brush and get out my nicer one. And we're just, there's nothing fancy about painting on the lettering. You're just going to go over each letter with your brush uh, using the tip of your brush and just paint it on. Now you can paint it on like a pencil if you are really good at um, using a brush and you have a lot of experience with it. Or you can break up each letter into parts if that makes it a little bit easier for you to maintain control. There's not really a wrong way to do this, just whatever is easiest for you to maintain control. So with the J, I started on the bottom versus the top. So I am doing it a little bit different than if I were actually writing uh, this on with a, a marker. So just do it however it works for you. Enjoy the ride. We'll see if I make a mistake or mess up here. So far, so good. Did it. <laughs> I did it. I made it. And so that I don't smear this, I'm going to set this aside and we'll mix our other colors. I'll give you guys a second though. Um, I will say though, if you uh, don't finish the lettering before I move on and mix the other colors, it's just black on the lettering. So you can always finish it when the class is over. All right, so let me switch to my older looking number four brush for mixing the other colors, but I gotta find where I put it. Here it is, okay. So um, we're gonna start by mixing a red orange, um, but. Before we do that, we do need to put three more scoops of water into all the other wells on our palette. If you have a different palette than mine, it'll just be six wells, because that's what I have left on my palette. So I'm going to do three scoops of water into the remaining six wells on my palette in the same way we did with black. All right, and so this bike, if you can believe it, is actually red orange. Uh, it looks, I think it looks red under the camera maybe, but it's actually a bright red orange. So we're gonna mix that by mixing equal parts of alizarin crimson, which is the only red in your set, and the cadmium red pale hue. I mean, it has red in the name, but it looks orange. So we're gonna mix the orange and the red in our set, equal passes of both. So I'm gonna do three passes of each. You can start with either one, it doesn't really matter. I can see I have a little bit of blue on my red from a project I was working on yesterday that you guys will see in just a few minutes here. So I'm gonna just clean off that half pin so I don't put blue into my red orange color. So I'm gonna do three passes of each. And because I'm using an old brush, I can really dig it into that half pan to pull out the pigment. And I don't have to worry about flattening the tip because I don't paint with it anymore, I just mix with it. I do recommend you hang on to your old brushes. All right, so I have my red orange, equal passes of cadmium red pale hue and alizarin crimson. 
Our next color cream is probably the most specialized color. We're going to use three colors to achieve the correct hue. We're gonna start with yellow ochre. Yellow ochre is the darker yellow on your bottom row. I'm gonna start with a single pass of yellow ochre. A single pass of yellow ochre. And then I wanna add just a touch of burnt umber to it, but I'm not going to do a full pass of it because it's already wet from when we used it for black. So I'm just gonna gently wipe my brush over the burnt umber just a couple times. It's maybe a half a pass or a third of a pass. And I'm gonna stir that into the yellow ochre. So it's just going to tint it a little, just make it slightly darker. And then to get the cream, I'm just going to add four to five passes of Chinese white. So I'm just gonna darken it with Chinese white, or sorry, not darken it, I'm gonna lighten it. <laughs> lighten it with Chinese white. So I'm gonna add four passes or so. So I'm mixing this color, I'll say it again in case you missed it. One pass of the yellow ochre, just a half a pass or even a third of a pass of burnt umber, and then a few passes of Chinese white. Now, if your finished color looks a little too uh, uh, muted to you, you can add a touch more yellow ochre to it to brighten it up by just kind of doing the same thing you did with burnt umber where you're just kind of putting the tip of your brush into it for just a second or two. So this is sort of the color we're looking to get. It's just a nice pretty cream or even sand kind of color. And we'll be using that on the basket and on the bicycle seat. All right. And then we have one more sort of specialty color that uses three colors in our set. And that's a burnt orange color. And the burnt orange color will be used as the shadow color on the bicycle seat and on the basket itself. Let's start by just using burnt sienna. Burnt sienna is the reddish brown in our set. So I'm gonna start by doing um, four passes of burnt sienna, four passes. And this is a pretty, it almost sort of looks burnt orange, the burnt sienna in and of itself, but I'm gonna make it a little bit darker than that. So four passes of the burnt sienna. And then I'm going to add one pass of yellow ochre to it. Yellow ochre was the color we just used. So this is gonna kind of brighten it up a little. It almost makes it look amber colored or yellow topaz, I think. So I did four passes burnt sienna, one pass yellow ochre. And then I wanna do another half pass of burnt umber just to darken it up just a little. And there's our burnt orange be a good fall color. And then um, the, the last three colors are a little bit easier than those two specialized colors we just mixed. Uh, for the next color, we're gonna mix a light green and we're gonna mix that by just using sap green. So the light green today is just sap green. Sap green is the lighter of your two greens on the bottom row, second from the left. And I'm going to do six passes of sap green. And then you don't need to clean your brush because we're gonna use sap green for the next color. We're going to mix a dark green now by doing equal parts of sap green and ultramarine blue. So three passes of sap green, three passes of ultramarine blue. Ultramarine blue is the one we use when we mix black. So it's the blue that is second from the right on the top row. I'm not even gonna clean my brush as I move from sap green to ultramarine blue. I can always clean the top of the half pans at a later time. It's usually what I'll do is I'll clean them when I start the next project. <laughs> so equal passes, sap green, ultramarine blue. And then the last color is just cadmium yellow. So you can see my cadmium yellow is a little dirty from using cadmium red pale hue. So I can just take my wet brush over the surface of that half pan and then rinse it until all of that other color is removed from the top of that half pan. And then it's clean and I can use it to mix my yellow without worry that the other color that's dried on top will influence what I'm mixing. So cadmium yellow for the last color, six passes or so. And then there's a pretty palette and we can get going.
I'm going to switch once again to my nicer brush. I'm going to shuffle some things aside. So I shouldn't need to mix any more colors today. This is a simpler project here. All right, so I want to start by applying that cream color we mixed to the bicycle seat and the bicycle basket. So I'm just going to put a little bit of cream on my brush and I'm just going to cover the entire seat in the entire basket with paint. The entire seat and the entire basket. And you guys may hear my son in the background. School is out for us. So he's home and I hear him making lots of noise. <laughs> So if you hear a kid screaming, happy screams, but if you hear it, it's my son. All right, and then I am going to paint on my basket. Basket gets entirely cream as well. All right, and then I'm going to quickly rinse and blot my brush. And while the seat and basket are still wet, I'm going to put just a little bit of burnt orange on the tip of my brush. And I'm going to run it along the left side of the seat and bottom edge. And I'm going to let that burnt orange just bleed into the cream I just applied. So left edge and bottom edge of the seat. And I'm just gonna let it bleed in organically into the cream. And to the basket, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to apply it along the left edge and maybe half of the bottom edge, maybe not the whole bottom. So left side and maybe half of the bottom edge of the basket. And then we'll be ready to apply the red orange color to our bicycle frame. Um, I want to give you a couple options here. If you look at my finished piece, I kind of just painted them on smoothly. I just, you know, one stroke to each part of the frame. You can also, if you want a kind of a looser bicycle look, instead of doing this as you apply your paint, you can do sort of hatching strokes where um, you just sort of lift your brush in between each stroke to create more jagged edges. I think this will create a looser look, the, the second option, but the first option is fine. I, it looks like I went with the first option when I made this piece, but today I may do the more jagged option just to show you the difference between the two. Um, so this one takes a little more time because you're, you're kind of hatching the, each part of the frame than this one where it's a single smooth stroke, but I think the second one gives a little more character. So just to the entire frame, wherever it's that red orange, we are going to apply uh, the red orange. So I might start over here. And it's okay, you don't need to cover the entire outline we drew. Um, the outline is really just a guide for placing color. You can erase your graphite lines when we're done. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm just going to apply strokes that are the natural width of my brush. I'm not going to worry about if I totally cover um, each part of the frame for my outline. So I'm just going to start and just sort of catch this color on or you can do single strokes is fine too. And I'm gonna just kind of take my time and do the entire bicycle frame. And I'm gonna rotate as I go to help maintain control. So I'm sorry if you're watching me and don't get um, dizzy. <laughs> You guys can maybe make a couple of these and see which style you like best. If you like a more tight controlled style or if you like the more loose dabbing, hatching kind of style. There's no wrong answer. Kind of just depends what technique you're going for. Now for that chain cover, I am just gonna sort of uh, paint that on. Since that's so big. Maybe I'll try to do some dabs around the edges, but for the most part, I'm just painting that on. Now I have the right side of the bike.
And let me make sure I'm not missing anything here. I think I got it all. You see these, the way I did it, they're much choppier, they're much looser as I did the hatching way instead of just a single smooth stroke. I'm gonna rinse my brush. And I'm gonna to return to the burnt orange. I'm gonna use the burnt orange to apply some cross, ha cross hatching strokes on the basket. So to do cross hatching strokes, basically you'll do several parallel angled lines going in one direction. And then you'll do several parallel lines going in the opposite direction to create a cross hatching. This will be a um, diagonal, diagonal cross hatching. So I'll start, um, maybe I'll just do one right through the middle and then I'll just paint on a few uh, parallel lines going in the same direction. You can see they all end at different points. I'm not trying to extend them all the way to the other side of the basket. You can if you want, you don't have to. And then I'm going to apply more uh, going in the other direction. And this creates the basket weave. And it's okay if all the lines aren't just at equally distance, that'll add to the loose nature. And then we're going to return to black again. We used it for the lettering and now we're gonna use it on um, the handlebar and the foot pedal. So I've used this technique in some of my other classes. What we're going to do is I'm going to apply a thin line of black along the bottom edge of the handle. I'm going to place my brush in the water for a split second, wipe it several times on the rim of my glass container, and then I'll apply that diluted version of black to the rest of the handle bar. And uh, what that will do is it'll create a bit of a gradient where it's darker along the bottom edge and looks more gray along the top. So I wanted to talk us through that first before I actually do it. So I'm just gonna put a little bit of black on the tip of my brush. You know what, I can actually do this at the same time, I think, to the handle and to the foot pedal. So I'm gonna do a thin line of black along the bottom edge of the handle and bottom edge of the foot pedal, because these are very small areas. And then brush and water for just a split second, wipe it lots of times, because we don't need much water on our brush. And then I can apply that diluted version to the rest of the handle and to um, the top part of the foot pedal. And you'll see how it creates a bit of a gradient, which is a nice little tip and a helpful technique. And I'll also go ahead and apply pure black to um, that bar that connects to the foot pedal. I'll go ahead and paint that on right now too. And then we're gonna be ready to apply black to the wheels and to the spokes and to the chain. Um, but let's start with the wheels or the tires. Um, so I'm gonna use that same stroke I used for the frame and I'm going to use that inner circle as my guide. So I'm going to sort of apply my strokes, just the width of my brush and that same sort of hatching stroke along that inside circle of my brush. And you'll just have to be careful as you work in between and around um, the frame. And I'm just going to go all the way around the tire. I'm going to have to twist and turn again. Help me maintain control here. And if you don't have to, I'm jealous. <laughs> when I make my time-lapse videos for uh, the Michael's YouTube channel, I, uh, I can't twist and turn and it is a challenge. <laughs> so I guess I can do it. I just don't like doing it. All right, so do one tire and then do another tire. So you can see the um, first circle I drew, you can still see that. You can see I did not try to fill in all of the space in between those two circles. I just want my strokes to be what is achieved through the natural width of my number four brush. And I just think that's important to, uh, to point out. Uh, if, you, if you fill in the entirety of space in between the two circles, your uh, beachcomber may look more like a mountain bike. <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> that's okay because they usually have thicker tires. I've seen some bikes that just have ridiculously thick tires.
All right, so again, I'm not trying to have my circles look perfectly smooth and straight. They are kind of jagged, and I think that adds to the loose look. And then for the spokes, I'm just going to apply black to every single spoke using the tip of my brush. I'm just going to try and do thin lines using the tip of my brush. I'm only going to add more paint to my brush if I need to, because by um, painting on as many spokes as I can with what's on my brush, I kind of get some spokes that are really black and then some that look more dark gray. Um, and I think that's sort of a fun look. So I just add more paint to my brush when um, I need to add more. So I can kind of get some different colors going or different values, I guess you could say. And then I'll repeat to my other tire. And I haven't forgotten about the chain that sort of crosses the uh, spokes. We'll get to that here in just a little bit. All right, but first I'm going to paint on the chain guard with black. That's that circle that is underneath the chain guard cover. Um, I'm just going to do the bottom part of the circle, the one that peeks out underneath the cover. And then I'll trace around or paint around that smaller circle in the middle and then those lines that go all around. And then I'll paint on the uh, bike chain that extends from that chain guard to the cover. I just want it to stand out as being in front. So I, that's why I saved it for last. So it kind of looks in front of all the spokes. And while I have black on my brush, I want to go ahead and just do one more line along the bottom of the handle and the bottom of the foot pedal. And I also want to draw a line of black for that little bar that attaches to the frame to the basket. If you look at my finished one, I forgot it. Can you see that? It's missing. <laughs> so the basket's kind of floating. So it's just, I, it looks like it's floating there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I didn't forget today. So make sure you draw a little black line from the frame to the bike. Don't forget that. Um, or your, your basket will look like it's floating, like mine. Okay, and then you can clean and rinse your brush and blot it. And we just applied a thin black line to the bottom of the handle and the bottom of the foot pedal. I wanna do the same thing with burnt orange to the seat. I wanna just do a thin line of burnt orange where we applied it earlier. So along the left side of the seat and the bottom edge, just a pure line of burnt orange. I want it to stand out. I'm not going to transition it. I'm just gonna let it be a solid line of burnt orange. And then I'm going to do the same thing to the basket. I'm going to apply a line of burnt orange along the left side and maybe bottom left half of the bottom of the, the um, basket. And then I want to go over some of the hatching strokes again, but I just want it to be the left half of the basket because the goal here is to make the left half of the basket look a little darker than the right half. And that creates form versus just a shape. So I'm going to just go over maybe half of the left half of the um, half the left half of the basket, those uh, hatching strokes I did. So I'm not going over all the hatching strokes, just the hatching strokes I can see on the left side. I hope that makes sense. I want my hatching strokes on the right side to just be that one layer so it can make it look like the left half of the basket is darker. And then we have one more thing to do to the bike before we paint on the really fun flowers and grass, which are my favorite elements of this whole piece here. Um, I wanna apply more paint to the frame, um, more red orange, but we're not going to apply it to the entire frame. I'll hold up my finished example here. 
If you look really closely, you can see thin lines of a lighter color through the middle of every part of the frame. That's because I'm only going to apply red orange to each edge of the frame. And I'm going to try not to apply anything to the very middle because that creates a highlight. So I'm just going to take my uh, red orange here and I'm just going to kind of follow my little jagged lines. I'm going to do the top and the bottom of each section, but I'm going to try and leave the middle without a second layer of paint so that first layer can kind of appear like a highlight. So this will be a little bit quicker because we already have the paint on. And so I am just using a straight line for this. I'm just kind of following my jagged lines as I apply more red orange to the top edge and bottom edge of each section of the frame. Now, if you accidentally cover the entirety of some aspects of the frame, that's fine. The goal here is just to have a little bit of that first layer still peeking through the middle in some parts to, like I said, serve as a highlight. This is technically not something you have to do. If you just want to leave it that first layer, you can do that. I just kind of like the added look of um, the second layer over the top and bottom edges. And I'm going to save the, um, the cover for the, the chain for last because that is a wider piece. And I'm going to apply it to most of it. I'm just going to try once again to just leave a thin line throughout the middle. All right, and so chain guard. I'm going to just kind of paint on top and bottom and just leave a little bit through the middle to serve as a highlight. Hopefully you can see those highlights under the camera here. They're random and sporadic. And then we'll be ready for the basket. I'm gonna demo the flowers real quick. I'll give you a second to finish up the frame. Every time I've practiced this class, I haven't had to mix more red. And of course today I do. So let me just mix a little bit more red because we will need just a little bit for the flowers on the basket. Okay, and I'm going to demo for you um, the flowers we're going to do at first. So the yellow spikes on the basket, I'm calling celosia. They look like celosia plumes. So we're just going to be real loose and, and fun with these uh, flowers. Um, let me see, I have, I'll put some yellow on my brush. So you're going to always start at the bottom of the celosia and move up towards, towards the point. And it's going to be a series of just maybe curved lines and dot scribbles. You're just going to sort of dance with your brush as you move in an upward direction. I'll show you that again. I know it's really fast. So I'm just kind of uh, curving and dotting and just moving up to a point. I'll model that for you again. Okay, so you can kind of see I'm not really being careful. I'm just being real loose. I'm more just using the tip, the side, and just kind of dancing up to the top. Okay. So I'm going to apply just as many celosia plumes as I can sort of fit onto the basket with a little bit of space in between. And then we can always add more if we want. So I might just start with one kind of right in the center, kind of start at the bottom and just sort of use that same sort of dancing technique up. And then I might angle another one kind of to the right of that. So we kind of want them to make a fan shape. And I might squeeze one over here. And then I'll work from the left, from the middle left. And they don't all have to start at the very bottom of the basket. You can have some that sort of move to the side as well. You can even put some a little tucked behind the handlebar of the bicycle. I have six there. I might add another one when we do the other flowers. We'll see. So don't get caught up in the details, just dance your brush up to a tip, up to a point. And for the little, little red flowers, these could be red zinnias, they could be poppies, or they could be any number of red flowers that are smaller than celosia plumes. We're going to paint those on in much the same way, they're just going to be much smaller. Um, so you'll just kind of maybe do like a curved stroke and a dot and maybe another curved stroke, almost like little roses. So curve dot, you're just sort of, same thing. You're just kind of dancing with your brush. It's just gonna be more in a circular 
uh, motion or, or shape instead of a plume or a spike. Okay, so we're just gonna squeeze in some of those little orange, red orange uh, flowers here and there wherever there's some negative space. It's okay if some of it bleeds into the yellow because that's gonna uh, mix and blend together to be like a red orange. And that looks really nice and lovely. And it will kind of make this whole bouquet look a little more loose. So we're gonna just squeeze those in. There's maybe, I don't know, nine of them, 12 of them. You don't need to count, just kind of add them wherever you can. We can always add more when we're done with the leaves. So hold that up so you can see. And then we'll be ready for the leaves. We're gonna use both greens for the leaves, but we're gonna start with the darker green. And the darker green is gonna be used to make traditional leaf shapes. So you're going to make uh, one curved line. I always start at the bottom and then lift towards the tip, but you can do it however you want. And then you'll do a curved line that mirrors that and pull it up. Now on that one, I left quite a bit of space between the two. You can make them so they don't have a space at all or just a real thin space, or you can have a combination of, of all of them. And you can even do it so there's a little opening at the top. But we're just doing kind of two lines that mirror each other that are slightly curved. And we are going to put these just wherever we can fit them in. And it's okay if they bleed in with the red, it's okay if they bleed in with the orange. I try to find the white space for them, but it's okay if there's a little bit of bleeding or overlap. That is okay. And just sort of fan them out just like all the other colors. You can even put some sort of angled from the edges of the basket. I think that's like a nice little touch, makes it look more finished, if you will. So let's see, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Maybe I'll do 11 for that rule of odds that I talk about sometimes in my classes, which means I should probably put another Solosia spike in there somewhere. So hold that up so you can see. I know I'm moving a little bit faster now. It's already 2.55 if you can believe it. Um, all right, so with the sap green or the lighter green, we're just going to do single thin strokes to almost look like grass. Um, so I can show my little scrap paper here. So I'm just gonna do single thin strokes. I, you can do just one at a time. You can do pairs. Um, you're just gonna do thin strokes, just uh, wispy little lines here, there, and everywhere, mostly along the top. This sort of serves as filler in the bouquet or just some greenery in the bouquet. I'm actually selling uh, bouquets of cut flowers at the farmer's market this summer. So this is also like, hits home. All right. So just kind of squeeze them in wherever you can. And then if you wanted to at this point, you could always add a little of something else. If it looks too uh, uniform to you, you could always add a little bit more to the top. I think because of time, I'm going to leave mine as it is. This looks like a very full bouquet. <laughs> so, and I'm going to show you how to paint on the grass. And the grass is really quick. Um, the grass uses both greens for the most part, and I would say even mostly the sap green, but we will throw a little bit of the yellow in there because when you mix yellow with either green, it's going to make more of a yellow green shade. So remember how I talked about dancing uh, with your brush when you're applying the celosia plumes? We're going to do the same thing with the grass. So we're going to just dance with our, uh, our paint with the grass. Um, I'm going to use the tip of my brush, the side of my brush, um, and I'm just going to sort of just kind of dance across the page to create the shape of grass. And without cleaning my brush, I might dip it into another green or even into the yellow, and I'm going to keep going. And I'm just going to kind of dance across. So it's really abstract. It's really loose. And then after we sort of have the base done, we can sort of pull from the wet paint and create actual blades of grass here and there. And if I were to put my brush into yellow, you can see how it adds a bit of color. And as it kind of blends with all the colors on the page, it um, takes on more of a yellow green shade. So I'll show you what I mean. I just wanted to demo for you so you can see what I mean by dancing with your brush across the paper. And I'm gonna start with the sap green, I think, and I'm going to apply that along the bottom left tire. 
And I think I need just a touch more sap green here. So bear with me. All right. So I'm just going to sort of dance across the bottom of the page. I might even put a little bit sort of above the, the tire here. And then I might dip my brush in the dark green and just sort of go over it in a few spots and then just continue dancing with your brush underneath the bicycle. Just doing various lines and, and shapes using all different aspects of your brush, the point, the side, just make your way all the way across to the other side. And before I get to the other side, I'm gonna go ahead and dip my brush in yellow. And you can do this at any point. It doesn't have to be at the very end. And then that creates red orange, or sorry, yellow orange. With the yellow orange in my brush, I might go back to the left side. I might do a little bit in the middle. So you're just kind of doing a combination of all three greens, just dancing with your brush. And then with all of this wet paint, just as we applied that second greenery to the bouquet where we're just doing thin lines, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna just kind of pull some wispiness out of um, some of the paint to create some thin wispy blades of grass. So this is what is cool. Even if this doesn't look like a photorealistic grass, no one who looks at this piece is, is going to guess it's anything other than grass. Um, it's okay to just get the impression of something to be loose and light. Um, that can be really hard. Um, I'm actually, um, when I use colored pencil as a medium, I'm very photorealistic. So it can be very hard to just like loosen up and just have fun. And grass is something you just wanna loosen up and have fun with. Don't think too hard about it. And just sort of play and, and have fun as you uh, apply the grass shape. I think the grass might be my favorite part of this whole piece. Cause I think it's just sort of fun to, to paint on and just to play around with. And then once you're done with the grass, that's it. You're done, unless you just wanna make any other adjustments elsewhere, um, but that's your bicycle. And I know it got a little faster at the end, but um, hopefully you guys were able to keep up with me. I do wanna show you um, my class on June 7th that Tim mentioned at the beginning, Birds of Paradise. And then I'd love for you to hold up your artwork if you were able to paint along with me today. But let me show you the Birds of Paradise. So this will be Tuesday, June 7th. Um, these two birds of paradise stems, they're really bright and colorful and um, I think they're easier than they look. The stems will use a lot of different colors and we'll even talk a little bit about color theory, how when you add opposite color on the color wheel to its opposite or complement, it darkens that color and kind of de-intensifies that color. We'll be using that uh, color theory technique a little bit in this piece, um, but I hope you'll join me for that. This was down to the wire. I literally painted this and submitted everything yesterday. So we are down to the wire, but I'm excited. This is the first time I've taught a class with just like a two week turnaround. So this will be really fresh in my mind when I teach it on the seventh, which I, I kind of appreciate. Usually I have to freshen myself up with what I did and what techniques I used. So it'll be nice not to have to do that with the Birds of Paradise. All right, so I'm gonna share my other camera and I'm also gonna switch to gallery view on Zoom so I can see all of your bicycles amazing. These look so good. Great job, everyone. I'm a lot of you painted along with me today. That's amazing. Wow. And I say this every class. Um, I only see like a one inch size picture of your bicycles. So if you, you can send me an email, I do my best to respond to everyone who writes me. If I don't, it's just because I got distracted by other things. I do my best to respond to everyone who writes. Um, so you can tag me on social media. Um, my handle across all of social media is at Mandy Peltier Artist. You can also go to my website, mandypeltier.com, and there's a contact tab there with my email address, and you can just directly email me if you want. Um, but you guys did an amazing job. I'm really proud of you all, and you should be very proud of yourselves. You did awesome. So I hope I see you on the 7th, and until then, um, I hope you do well, and I'll see you soon.